I'm Shamil. You might remember me. Uh, and um, we teased you enough during uh, the first days of the summer school with this spectral prediction. So I guess it's a good thing to finally talk about what this is. And um, uh, basically, um, most, if not all, talks on this summer school are devoted to shotgun proteomics, a technique to identify and quantify uh, proteins in the samples of interest. Um, and to do that, shotgun proteomics relies on uh, the fragmentation spectra, uh, the ones that you can see on the right side of this picture. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there are several techniques to uh, use fragmentation spectra for peptide identification. Uh, one of the most popular ones is database search. Uh, and uh, it exploits our knowledge of peptides um, because they have regular oligomeric structure and also they fragment um, the bond breakage during the fragmentation occurs primarily in the peptide in the backbone. So um, if you know the fragmentation method and uh, the peptide sequence, we can easily calculate the fragment masses. So uh, with these masses, one can create uh, theoretical MSMS spectra. And as you can see, all peaks here uh, have the same height because we calculated masses, but we don't know anything about intensities. So then we also have experimental spectra and you, we can compare them, um, compare experimental with the theoretical one uh, using some kind of scoring algorithm. For example, Andromeda database search in MaxQuant. And this approach will have been successfully applied for many years. However, um, the, intensity, the intensity is a valuable information and we don't want to just lose it. So one way to utilize it uh, is to assemble libraries from the previously measured spectra and using them in the subsequent research. The advantage of this approach is that um, I don't make any assumptions uh, about the peaks based on reference protome. We just use the peaks themselves. Uh, so this approach is hypothesis free and in principle it can, it can accommodate non-standard peaks that um, do not belong to any uh, standard ion series. So, they would not just calculate them from the peptide sequence. Uh, however, uh, any new peptides in our samples will be lost in the analysis. We just don't have peaks for them. So uh, the solution to this problem is to dedicate the acquisition of project-specific libraries. Um, and it solves the issue, but adds measurement effort to a project. Because then uh, we would basically need to first run um, experiments to obtain spectral libraries, spend some time and money on to do that, and then use these libraries for this search. Uh, so uh, this method is applied only when the benefits from uh, the increased sensitivity uh, strongly outweighs the downsides. And one of the areas for its application is DIA. Uh, because due to many co-fragmentations, the spectra are more complex and uh, this um, additional information from spectral libraries is useful to untackle the contributions of different peptides in spectra. Uh, but there is also a third solution um, to generate artificial predicted libraries. And thus we come to spectrum prediction. So what is spectral prediction? Uh, here we mean reconstruction of the peptide fragmentation pattern from its sequence. And people have been trying to do it uh, for nearly 20 years, but only recently uh, the uh, development uh, of, uh, in machine learning uh, enabled spectrum prediction with near experimental accuracy. So this lecture would be about these methods and their application in the shotgun proteomics. But first, I will briefly um, improve the core machine learning concepts. 
what is machine learning? Uh, it's a set of uh, methods to build uh, models from the experimental data. And uh, there are numerous ways to classify machine learning algorithms. They can be supervised and unsupervised. Uh, if in supervised learning, we have some uh, values, numerical or categorical, to predict. And um, in sup unsupervised learning, the goal is to find patterns in the, in the data itself by clustering or dimensionality reduction. Uh, so as you can see, there are clusters here. Um, supervised learning can be further divided into classification and regression. And uh, it means simply that in, in classification, we have categorical values to predict and in regression, numerical values. So spectrum prediction is the regression task. And uh, the targets to predict here are intensity values. So uh, another thing is deep learning. And I suspect that um, uh, considerably more people know about deep learning uh, since the last summer school when I first give, gave this talk because of the um, uh, huge advances in this area. But still, um, uh, I would describe what this is. Basically, it's... Um, very hot and advanced area of machine learning that uses neural networks as models. Uh, neural networks are systems of connected units called neurons uh, organized in layers. And the term deep in deep learning uh, stands for the use of multiple layers in model. So it's like going deep. Um, on this slide, you can see the scheme of the simplest neural network architecture called multi-layer perceptron. The neurons can transmit signals modulated by weights, um, by weights assigned to connections. And additionally, some kind of activation function can be applied to the signal, um, introducing nonlinearity to the transformation. Uh, weights can be adjusted to data in the process called backpropagation. And uh, this way, the models adapt to data and learns it. Uh, one of the hallmarks and the main advantage of deep learning is the ability of neural networks to um, directly learn higher level concepts from the original data without additional uh, feature engineering. So this um, simplifies the preprocessing of data. However, to train such models, you will need uh, considerably more data and computational resources. A lot of advanced uh, neural network architectures have been developed for specific tasks. Um, among the most popular ones are convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and transformers. Uh, all of them were applied to the spectrum prediction. Particular success have been achieved with the recurrent neural networks. The transformers are getting more traction in this year. So recurrent neural networks are designed to process sequential data, which uh, makes them naturally um, good for processing peptide sequences. And um, classic the current neural network models had troubles processing um, information spread uh, across long distances, which is kind of important in spectral prediction. However, more advanced models, such as long short term memory and gated recurrent units, address this issue. Just look at this. Um, so, back to spectral prediction. Uh, there are two main ways to predict fragmentation spectra. Uh, predicting ion series intensities or full spectrum. And the most popular ones is um, uh, the former, which is focusing on predefined ion series types. So one would need annotated spectra to uh, train such models. 
and it will they will predict uh, these and only these um, ion types. But uh, this approach is not affected by co-fragmentations. So several neural network um, based models have been developed to um, do this task, and most of them are based on RNN structure. Uh, so in the, on this slide, as an example, uh, we have the um, uh, scheme of DeepMass Prism model, where there are several LSTM layers that uh, receive tight sequences of variable length, and they transform them into a fixed length representation and pass this representation into a multi-layer perceptron that outputs um, intensities. Uh, we can also use not deep learning, but uh, conventional machine learning to do this um, task. However, uh, the problem is that uh, conventional machine learning cannot directly process uh, data that's shaped um, differently. So they cannot process these uh, peptide sequences of variable length. So one of the ways that uh, we can solve this problem is uh, to use several models. Just uh, you um, make additional model for each uh, peptide length. And this approach uh, is uh, simple to implement, but also loses um, synergy from peptides of different length. Um, so for ease of comparison, here we have multi-layer perceptron as a model, but in principle, any uh, machine learning model can be here inside that of it. And this approach is implemented in MS2PIP, where they use actually not multi-layer perceptron, but XGBoost to predict intensities. The third way to do it is to use window-based methods. When we have um, a sliding window centered on peptide bond, and this window goes through peptide sequence and uh, fixes uh, it like it records um, I mean assets that appear ins inside of it. So since window has fixed length, uh, it transforms the data from variable length one to fixed length one. And uh, after that, again, any model can be used. In this case, it's multi-layer perceptron, and this approach is implemented in Vina. So um, briefly about full spectrum prediction, uh, the second main, main way to predict spectra. Um, this approach is complicated uh, by co-fragmentations, but um, so they, one would need to somehow reduce co-fragmentations either by spectral clustering or setting the thresholds. Uh, however, uh, Using this approach, one can predict mm, non-backbone ions, um, which is not possible in the ion series based one. And uh, the first model utilizing this approach was developed in 2020 um, and by Liu et al. And they used uh, convolutional neural networks for that. Uh, actually, recently, I think in this year, Another paper was published um, that also utilized this approach, but used transformers instead of it. So, so far I've uh, seen only these two papers. So this is kind of developing field, but it's interesting to look what would be next. Okay, so now let's see. Um, some projects where intensity prediction was utilized to improve peptide identification. First, um, the DDA applications. And in DDA, intensity information can be integrated into search engine um, to, update, to improve its sensitivity, specificity, or, or, or both. Um, so for example, in this work, um, ILA will cellulize it, so human proton, was analyzed with max quant. And then Andromeda search score was augmented by predictions from several different models, namely DeepMass Prism, 
Vina and the master peep. So as you can see, the improvement uh, in sensitivity is Q value of PSM FDI dependent and is higher at smaller, at smaller Q, Q values, which is good because this is the area we are most interested in. So here is the same plot, but zoomed in into the range from zero to 1% FDR. And uh, this is the gain in uh, PSMs for different models. And this is the gain in peptides. So at the standard cutoff of 1%, the improvement with deep learning uh, was around uh, 4%, which is good, but not spectacular. However, one can expect that um, in larger search spaces, the benefits are more substantial because there would be, on average, more uh, peptide spectrum matches that need to be uh, found within a certain tolerance window. And we have such, such spaces in uh, immune, immunopeptidomics and protogenomics. So, immunopeptidomics is area that focuses on peptides derived from human leukocyte antigens. Um, these peptides are generated by protosomal cleavage uh, inside the cells, and then they are relocated to the cell surface. So these peptides are short enough uh, that they can be analyzed by mass spectrometry directly without additional digestion. But uh, since the digestion that generated it, uh, them was not uh, triptych. We don't. We have no knowledge about the termini amino acids, so that increases our search space. Additionally, the rules uh, governing this um, digestion are different from the triptych ones, and uh, one. So what one would need to train models specifically on non-triptych peptides to predict fermentation spectra of these peptides. However, a trained model can yield very good results. So, for example, in this work, Matthias Wilhelm et al. reprocessed the data set consisting of um, HLA class 1 peptides from 95 monallelic cell types, and they used the PROSIT model. In this model, they, rec they rescored uh, proposed PSMs, and um, here on this plot, you can see the green bars uh, for peptides that they gained after that, uh, red bars that for peptides that they lost, and blue bars uh, for shared peptides. So overall, they were able to achieve on average a 1.5-fold improvement in terms of identified proteins. Uh, also, similar scoring studies uh, also suggest that uh, integration of um, spectrum prediction information can benefit immunopeptidomic studies. So the second area that I mentioned that can benefit from this is protogenomics. Protogenomics is the study of proton with the aid of um, genomic or transcriptomic sequences. So this uh, can enable um, identifications of peptides that are not present in reference proton. Uh, but that would require in silica translation of various degrees. Uh, so from um, the inclusion of untranslated regions of um, mRNA, three prime and five prime ETRs, to six frame translation of the whole genome. So in this work, Ferbrugge and Atal uh, have shown that protogenomics can also benefit from spectrum prediction. And they generated protogenomic search spaces by ribos ribosomal profiling and uh, three-frame translation database based on RNA-seq. Uh, then they used the to peep and PROSIT to augment Andromeda search score. Uh, similar to the standard D analysis, the improvement is um, FDR dependent and is larger is in highly specific regions. So at the default cutoff of 1% FDR, uh, the increase in identifications was about 6%. So 
if we compare the benefits that different areas gain from the uh, spectrum prediction, uh, you can see that uh, immune epidemics is the clear winner. Uh, why that happens is not entirely clear, but um, that can be somehow related to the fact that they deal with non triptych peptides. So uh, now from DDA to DIA, as I've already told you, uh, in DIA, uh, um, in DIA, uh, use of spectral library is particularly uh, beneficial, uh, and most uh, peptide-centric um, DIA analysis workflows directly utilize uh, spectral libraries to analyze uh, DIA data. So in principle, we can just replace these measured spectral libraries with uh, predicted ones, and the um, software will not notice anything uh, if we constructed our spectral libraries in the right way. So uh, it was actually shown to be beneficial to use predicted libraries for DA data processing. So for, for example, in this uh, case, um, data on the left is um, um, cancer tissue studies, uh, and the, the data was analyzed with MaxQuant. Um, and this is the PCA plot of different uh, tissues. On the right, the same data was analyzed also in MaxQuant using MaxDA with predicted uh, libraries. Um, the same discovery mode that I showed in the previous lecture. And as you can see, this resulted in uh, more identifications and also better separation at the PCA plot. Uh, what's also interesting is how different models affect the identifications. So here, the same DA analysis on human HEP2, HEP J, G2 samples um, was performed with um, full proton spectral libraries predicted either by DeepMass Prism, um, Prozit, or Vina. And as you can see, there is a huge overlap in both genes and tides counts. Uh, so why this is interesting is because Vina is not um, uh, is not deep learning based model. It's uh, like it's a multi layer perceptron, yes. So it's technically deep learning, but it's very simple uh, neural network uh, compared to Prozit and uh, DeepMass Prism. So. But still, the results are comparable. And that suggests that faster and uh, so less um, data dependent, uh, less like. The approaches that require less training data to um, train uh, can be also used to. Um, process DA data. So these qualities make been uh, ideal for capturing spe um, project specific um, conditions such as uh, like non-standard proteases or fragmentation energies or other exceptional kind of circumstances in this documentation. Um, and for that reason, we decided to bring Vina to the community. But um, in the process, the Vina was changed because we replaced multi-layer perceptron with XGBoost. And uh, this to further improve um, prediction quality and uh, speed of the predictor. And uh, to reflect this change, we changed the name from Vina to XMAS. So, uh, also, Vina was implemented in Python. XMAS also started as the Python project, but at the moment it's fully transferred into C Sharp uh, as the additional model model to MaxQuant. 
So it's natively integrated in MaxQuant. And the idea is to use it both in DIA and DDA workflows. Uh, in DIA, it can predict in silica spectral libraries. That's exactly that on the fly prediction that I've talked about. And in DDA, uh, it can improve, um, it can rank uh, PSMs in uh, Andromeda 2.0 search engine. So for the boosting identifications. Uh, also, we plan to make use of um, uh, to enable user to make their own models with this uh, software. Uh, so, like I said, to capture their own instrumentation conditions. Uh, so, XMAS is not available at the moment, but it will be released in the future releases of MaxQuant. So, stay tuned. <laughs> and um, that's the end. Thank you for your attention.